I present to you an anthology of ghostly tales from Canada, a part of the world I've been meaning to cover for some time now. Considering the sheer expanse of its provinces and territories, and in order to even begin to do them justice, this will be the first of a three-part series. There have been numerous accounts given over the years regarding apparitions beckoning would-be victims of tragedy away from their likely demise. One example of this would be the story of fallen aircraft pilot Eddie McKellar, whom in 1950 was allegedly saved from the scorching outback of Western Australia by the ghostly vision of an Australian Air Force pilot, a story I featured in my 2020 video Tales of the Paranormal 2. So from the blistering heat of the Australian outback, to the frigid winter landscape of southern Quebec, here is a story told in my own words and based on an account given by a 19th century lumber merchant. It was originally published in the January 15th 1891 edition of the Ottawa Free Press. The merchant tells us that in January of 1853 he served as an assistant at a lumbering camp in Quebec. The main camp, he said, was situated 100 miles north of the Ottawa River but he was posted at a secondary camp, or shanty, which was two miles south of Lac Redpine. To the north of the lake was another smaller lumber camp known as Crooked Creek. A road said to be about 20 miles long ran between the two camps, including a trail across the frozen lake itself. The merchant was given the task of passing on some instructions to the foreman of the Crooked Creek camp by his chief, a man named Simpson. The merchant said it was a bright clear day as he took to the road for the long hike, and he made good time, arriving at the smaller base as the men were returning from work, their axes placed over their shoulders. He spent the night at Crooked Creek, passing on his instructions to the foreman the next morning, and leaving at around 10 o'clock. He said he must have reached the halfway point when a snowstorm set in. By the time he had reached Lac Red Pine for the last leg of his journey, the trail over the lake was completely covered in snow. It was falling heavily by now and visibility was poor. However, our unnamed protagonist felt confident that he knew the trail well enough, so he pressed on. He'd only gone a short distance when the snowfall became so thick that he couldn't see the shore from any direction. It was also getting dark and exceedingly cold. Managing to return to the north shore, he pondered his options. If he stayed where he was, he thought, he'd freeze to death. He feared that if he tried to return to the Crooked Creek camp and got stuck on the main road, he'd be eaten by wolves. As he stood at the shore, considering what few options he had, he said he looked out over the blizzard-stricken lake to see a man dressed in grey beckoning him forward. Thinking that his foreman, Mr Simpson, had sent out a worker to find him, he staggered forward building up to a run out of desperation as the grey man became increasingly obstructed by the blizzard. He called out to him to wait, but the stranger walked on, eventually disappearing from view. The merchant says that he stood in a state of despair as he looked around him before the man appeared once again. He was not stopping though. The merchant thought that he was either expressing his displeasure at being sent out on such a dangerous errand or simply trying to minimise his own chances of perishing in the storm. Finally, the stranger stopped, turned to the merchant and pointed into the woods. He then continued on himself for a short distance, before being completely concealed by the falling snow. By the time our storyteller had reached the shore, his saviour was nowhere to be seen. When he arrived at the lumber camp, he asked Mr Simpson who he had sent out to rescue him, why didn't he stop and wait, and why didn't he bring a sleigh? Simpson explained that he and all of the other men had assumed that he'd turned back to Crooked Creek after the blizzard hit. No rescue mission had been ordered, and no one expected to see him back for several hours. 
After relaying his experience to everyone at the camp, the merchant concluded that his saviour had not been of flesh and blood. Saturday Night was the name of Canada's oldest general interest magazine. It was founded in 1887 in Toronto and ceased publication in 2005. In a 1902 edition of the paper, I found a retelling of an experience remembered by a man who visited the island known as Main Station, situated to the east of Lake Huron, one and a half miles off the coast of Ontario, with his crew in 1889. The story says that after arriving on the island, the crew came across a stone structure which was thought to have sheltered US soldiers during the War of 1812. The shelter was divided into two compartments, each one had a fireplace. Deciding that the old building was sufficient shelter for the night, the men collected driftwood from the shore at the foot of a cliff, made a fire and settled in for the night. They sang songs and played an old card game known as whist. When the hour for sleep came, camp beds were arranged and each man retired. One man, the one who originally told the story, remained awake for several hours. He recalled the heavy breathing of the men around him, and the howling of the wind along with the crashing of waves at the foot of the cliff. Then through the sounds of nature came something quite unearthly. A loud bumping noise could be heard above everything else. This roused several men from their sleep. They moved to the entrance to see what it was, but it was too dark to make out anything. When the noise soon ceased, they returned to their beds. A few minutes later the noise returned, this time along with what sounded like distant cries for help. As the confused men looked to each other and then into the darkness beyond the door, an apparition suddenly appeared at the threshold. It was a blurred white human form. Within seconds it had disappeared, quote, as if the earth had opened to receive it. The remainder of the night was sleepless for most of the men in the group, and the next day they gladly left the island to continue their stay elsewhere on Lake Huron. In 1902, according to the Saturday Night publication, many human bones were found in and around the building, and deep in the earth surrounding it, solid brass cannons and other 19th century weaponry were uncovered. When looking into the story and trying to find out more about the stone structure, I found these old images of a brick building, this image was taken on Main Station Island in 1935 by one Alice Jane Corrigan of the Corrigan family, a well-known family of bakers who owned a shop in nearby Wyerton in the 1920s. A copy of the photograph is held at the Bruce Museum and the Cultural Centre in Southampton, Ontario, and is simply titled Ruins of an Old Building. This postcard of the same structure is marked HB Co, which denotes the Hudson Bay Company a former Anglo-Canadian but now American-owned retail business founded in the 17th century. Could this be the same ruin where our crew of men in 1889 were faced with a phantom in the dead of night? On February the 23rd, 1887, the Bowmanville Canadian Statesman newspaper printed a story allegedly told by a young doctor about an experience he had one night in a Toronto lodging house. It was early in his medical career, he tells us, a time when he also worked for a book subscription service, and he was in the city that day collecting payment from customers. The young man was finding it difficult to secure a room for the night, and after being turned away many times, he was offered the only room left in a boarding house in the centre of the city. The only problem was, the small room contained a corpse. It lay on a table in the centre of the room. If he could tolerate that, his host said, he was welcome to it. Well, it was late, and there was no other option for the man, unless he wanted to spend the night on the cold streets of Toronto. As he reluctantly took to his bed, he heard a door open towards the back of the building, someone enter and then whispering in the hallway outside his room. His thoughts then turned to the considerable amount of money he had on him from the day's collections and the fact that he had failed to hide the roll of bills as he paid for his board. He'd also had his candle taken from him when he retired for the night. Was this a strategic ploy by corrupt landlords to rid him of light? As he lingered on these thoughts, his blood froze as hoarse whispers came from the centre of the room. Come here, the voice said. 
Terrified and unwilling to accept that the corpse had spoken, the young doctor slowly edged towards the table. It spoke again. Look out, they are after your money, and they may murder you. They are capable of it. Now at his wit's end, the doctor felt his way through the darkness to the only window in the room, and found it couldn't be opened. He waited in the shadows. Then came the creaking of floorboards in the hallway before the door began to slowly open. A figure then burst in and plunged what looked like a blade into the empty bed. With that, the doctor threw himself through the pane of glass into the cold night air. He survived to tell his tale, of course, but there was a glaring matter that he pondered on. Was the messenger really dead? Had he been at death's door with just enough life remaining to deliver the message, or had he spoken those words from beyond the grave? On the afternoon of October 31st, 2007, well-known radio personality Joe Easingwood hosted a call-in show on the CFAX radio station based in British Columbia. One caller was a man named Ron Armstrong who told a tale of his days at the University of Victoria back in the early 70s. It was the beginning of a new academic year when he moved into the upper floor of a very old house in the city. The student dwelling was occupied by all males until a friend of Ron Armstrong by the name of Sandy moved in. She was, he said, tall, blonde and beautiful, a troubled yet free spirit who had found herself in a personal crisis and needed shelter. Room was sparse but she agreed to take a spare bed which was placed in the kitchen. For the first few nights all went well until Sandy began to complain of restless nights and broken sleep. She said she was also aware of a presence in the room. One night the presence she felt took a physical form. She awoke in the dead of night and saw a man standing in the kitchen. She said he wore an old-fashioned suit and a fedora hat, and he was surrounded by a yellowish light, while his face was dark and indistinguishable. The girl was understandably frightened, however she had no other living arrangements so could not simply up and leave. If what she'd already experienced wasn't bad enough, Things came to a head one night when she woke in the dark, struggling to breathe. She felt a huge pressure as if someone lay on top of her, although she felt no human form. After a few moments, the sensation subsided and she fled the room. Now desperate to leave but wanting answers, she asked that there be an investigation into what she experienced. And there was, of sorts. Armed with a Ouija board and, it should be said, copious amounts of marijuana, the students sat down with the wooden board. According to the original storyteller, Ron Armstrong, they asked, who are you? The board spelt out the name Thompson. When they asked why Thompson was here, the reply came, to see my wife. They asked if the man meant any harm. The spelled reply was, no, I love her. When asked when the man had died, the year given was 1936. The board, or Thompson, went on to indicate that his wife was indeed present, Shortly afterwards, Sandy left the dwelling, finding accommodation elsewhere. The alleged haunting was a subject of conversation in the apartment for a few days, but eventually it was forgotten by all, that is except Ron Armstrong. Completely taken by the possibility of a real haunting, he began to research the house's history. To his amazement, he said he found out that the house was occupied during the 1930s by A. C. H. Thompson and his wife. He had killed her in the master bedroom in a jealous rage. The master bedroom was, by the 1970s, the kitchen. Armstrong believed that Thompson had seen the image of his wife in Sandy and had returned to make amends. According to Armstrong, Thompson was hanged in 1936, and the hill on which the old gallows once stood could be seen from the living room window of the old house. It's an intriguing story, I could not find any information beyond Ron Armstrong's account though. When I looked at capitalpunishment.org slash Canada, where there is a record of all those executed in the country between 1860 and 1962, I found no mention of C.H. Thompson. Now I've said in the past that any ghost story should be treated as just that, a story. However, there's always a glimmer of hope, at least with me, that there might be an element of truth. There may have been a wife-murdering man named C.H. Thompson, but what we do know is he wasn't executed, which makes this story that much more dubious.
36-year-old Victor Raymond Gravelin had been a sports writer for Victoria's Colonist newspaper. When he lost that position in 1934, he turned to alcohol for solace. Some say that this was what ultimately ruined his marriage. By September of 1936, he and his wife, 30-year-old Doris Gravelin, had been living separately for 18 months. Since their separation, Doris had worked as a private nurse and cared for a woman named Kathleen Richardson in Oak Bay. According to Victor's parents, he was hoping for a reconciliation, and this is what led him to call Doris on the afternoon of September 22nd. She agreed to meet Victor at Victoria's Oak Bay Golf Club, a place they'd often visited during happier times. What they discussed during that walk around the golf club is not known, but following their meeting both Victor and Doris disappeared. When their respective families reported them missing on September the 24th, the only ominous piece of information they had was that at 9pm on the night they met, a resident living close by reported hearing a loud scream coming from the golf course. Five days passed, then on September 27th, a golf caddy named John Johnson saw what he believed to be a dead body on the beach close to the 7th green. On the shore, partially submerged in sand and partially covered by wooden logs, was the body of Doris Gravelin. Her cause of death was given as asphyxiation from strangling. Victor Gravelin was immediately suspected of murdering his ex-wife and a manhunt was launched. The Winnipeg Free Press stated October 22, 1936, states that Gravelin was believed to have been heading east towards Winnipeg on board a freight train. However, that turned out to be untrue, because three days later his body was found tangled in kelp weed. Many secondary sources claim that the hat and shoes Doris wore the night she met Victor were found inside the coat he wore when he was retrieved from the water. However, things get a little confusing when you read reports printed the day after Victor's body was found. This one from the Daily Alaska Empire says that he was still wanted for questioning. It goes on to say that Doris's shoes and hat were found inside a coat owned by Victor. Clearly the article was written as if he was still alive, so it suggests that the police found them inside another coat, possibly when they investigated his home. Whatever the true scenario may have been, the case was recorded as a murder-suicide, and the belief is that Victor drowned himself after killing Doris. His post-mortem stated that he died approximately four weeks earlier, so the dates fit. Doris and Victor Gravelin had one son named Walter. He was known to them as Robin and was seven years old when his parents died. The website Seek Ghosts claimed in a blog dated October 14th, 2013, that Walter was raised by his grandparents, went to school in England and served in the British Army. According to the website, he was unaware of how his parents died until a journalist contacted him in 1994 to discuss his mother, or more specifically, the ghost of his mother, which had allegedly been seen roaming the Oak Bay golf course for almost 60 years. The first reported sighting came about a month after her body was found. A man fishing off Gonzales Point saw what he believed to be a woman by some bushes. He said it looked as if she was floating while looking out to sea, but she paid him no attention. She wore an old-fashioned brown suit. Then he saw her rush towards the water before she faded away. Ever since that sighting by the sailor in 1936, there have been dozens of sightings of what is thought to be the ghost of Doris Gravelin. Another sighting was reported by a taxi driver who drove by the golf course at 2 o'clock one morning. He said he saw a thick cloud of mist in the road. As he drove through it with his windows down, he said he felt a cold chill and what felt like the fabric of clothing stroking his face. In the 1960s, university students claimed to have seen her rush towards them before disappearing. There is another story regarding author, paranormal investigator and self-proclaimed witch, Jean Kozokeri. She was in a group one night leading an investigation when a cold hand grabbed hers and then just as quickly let go. However, this supposedly happened in 1972, but when she spoke to the Brandon Sun newspaper in 1989, she failed to mention it. Most sightings have been reported in March and April. She has even been dubbed the April Ghost, and is said to appear day and night. Another interesting thing is that some report her wearing an old-fashioned brown suit, while others report a long dress. Could both manifestations be Doris Gravelin, or are they two separate entities? 
there is a brass bell situated between the 6th and 7th greens on the course. Legend has it that if the bell is rung three times, Doris will appear. <laughs>